Welcome to City Church, guys. It's good to have everybody here today. We're glad that you're with us. If you're in person or online, uh, we're about to get started. I just wanna say a couple of things while people are making their way into the room. This Friday night, February the 2nd, our men are gathering. Uh, I hope, guys, that you'll make plans to be here. Doors open at six. We're gonna have chili and cupcakes. My wife left that off. We're gonna have chili and cupcakes. And they were like, somebody asked me this week, it's like, it's a dude's thing. Like, do you want, really want cupcakes there? And I was like, yeah, I eat cupcakes and I'm a dude. And I think most dudes in here eat cupcakes. So we're having chili and cupcakes. And a good friend of ours, a friend of the church's, Mitch McKinney, will be bringing a word of encouragement, six to eight. Hey, listen, let me challenge you guys. Who can you invite? Right, when we do events like our men's event or our women's event, these aren't necessarily like who needs to be at City Church, right? I mean, obviously we wanna be a church that you feel comfortable inviting your friends to your family to come and be a part of, but some of these other events are just great opportunities to invite people who may be in another church, but just could use the community. So I've been sending out text messages, making phone calls, inviting guys, uh, and I would, men, I'd like to encourage you to do the same thing. But even if you don't invite a guy, that's okay. This Friday, six o'clock, you want to be a part of that. And then um, mo most of you don't know uh, <clears throat> this individual that I'm going to. Uh, uh, so a very dear brother in the faith of mine, uh, Mark O'Connell, uh, who lives in Florida, his family, uh, him and his wife, they were really fundamental in helping to get this church started, um, financially supporting us, supporting my family through the years, uh, you know, making contributions to the church, but even uh, uh, in seasons where uh, our transmission went out, you know, they stepped in and they bought a, they had the transmission repaired in our vehicle. And uh, uh, yesterday morning, his wife went to be with the Lord and it was really, uh, it's really heavy on my heart. And uh, I love that family. I love those guys. Um, and I only share it, not because this is somebody in my life, but you know, you're sitting in a seat today because of families like his uh, that uh, had a vision uh, or shared uh, the hope of a vision God gave my wife and myself and this team, and uh, they helped make this possible. And so I would just ask that we would keep the O'Connells in our, our, in our uh, prayers over the next couple of days. Um, uh, since she got sick in 2021, uh, Carmen and I were talking about it, he, he said he hasn't spent a single night away from her. Um, and, and they've been married since they were in college, and uh, so... Uh, almost 70 years old, I believe. So they've, they've just, you know, he lost his best friend. And so again, very heavy on my heart and I'm really thankful for that family. And I wanted to share that with you today uh, and just ask that you would be praying for the O'Connells. Uh, all right, well, let's uh, look at week three of Have Discipline. If you would stand to your feet for the reading of the word. We're gonna be in Luke chapter 12. We're gonna start here in verse 35. Okay, so this is Jesus speaking. He says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the 
proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready for or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him will be, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. I thank you for the opportunity to be in your word today. I thank you for the opportunity to uh, just uh, hear from you. I just pray that as I am uh, ministering, that it would be your thoughts uh, and your direction for our lives. Help us in our lives to always be prepared. In your mighty name, amen. You can be seated. So I've titled today's message, Always Be Prepared. So uh, Jesus in uh, the, the, the kind of the beginning of this group gathering uh, has been talking about stewardship and about the importance of managing our resources well. Uh, I just, I will say this, like, uh, a lot of times, like uh, uh, when, when I was younger, we used to, uh, we had Christian music, right? Christian rock bands, Christian uh, uh, hip hop, Christian, uh, we really didn't, I don't maybe there was Christian country. I think they were just gospel quartets or something. Uh, but then there came this thing where somebody would find a little bit of success, a little bit of fame, and then they would become, they would become more mainstream, secular. And then they would be like, well, we're, we're a rock band that's, we're Christians in a rock band, right? And I, I, in thinking about this type of mindset, we've kind of, the church has allowed a culture to kind of birth that allows the idea of being Christian to be an adjective, right? I'm a Christian rock band. Uh, musician, rocker, whatever. I'm a Christian contractor. I'm a Christian attorney. I'm a, you know what I'm saying? And, and it should be the other way. I'm an attorney that is a Christian, right? I am a musician that is a Christian. My identity is in Christ. Christ is not an adjective that is like an added descriptor for me, right? Because as an adjective, I can create all these additional adjectives to add to it, right? I'm a good looking, great smelling Christian contractor, attorney, doctor, whatever, right? And the, what I'm trying to get to, to, to the point there is that there's an identity issue when we think of ourselves in terms of what we do for a living or in terms of how we live our lives and then we just set, kind of set Christianity to the side. Oh, by the way, I'm a Christian, right? It's like the secondary thought. No, it should be the primary thought. So when it comes to our resources, and I know it's uncomfortable, but we don't like to talk about uh, money and sex and the, the things we do with our time. We don't want to talk about those things because culture has some really strong opinions already. And who wants to be canceled by culture, right? So we as Christians, we just do a keep our mouth shut and just, hey, I'm a Christian, by the way, but hey, don't come after me, right? And, and that is the opposite of what Jesus is saying here in this text. And so um, he, I just, I'm back up to this verse 32. He says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So it, you don't have to be thinking like this is a, 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 like risky behavior being a Christian. It's, there's no gamble in it. Like, oh, I'm a Christian, but man, if I, if I give a little bit of extra to this, this ministry this month or to the church, or if I, if I show up and give more time, like I might not get a return on my investment. And, and Jesus says, look, look, be a follower of Christ, listen to the word, and know this. It is your Father's good pleasure. He wants to give you good things. He wants to give you the kingdom. 
And so he comes right out of a conversation on stewarding resources. And if we just took the text today, jumping right into this idea of being prepared, we would think that he was changing the subject, right? And so there's two ways to change the subject in public speaking. One is that we call it bridging, and that's a transition that changes the subject uh, entirely. And the second is what we call a segue. This is a transition from one topic to another. So uh, I may be addressing the same overarching subject, but I'm going to kind of shift the topic internally. But Jesus isn't doing that. What Jesus is doing is undergirding what he has already said. And so in verse 35, he talks about the, he has talked about the idea of how we manage our resources. And he says the, the, the management of your resources, whether that is money or time, that's part of staying dressed for action. Like the way that I manage what I have and what I'm giving and what I'm letting up, that is a part of my active faith. He says, so stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Now, practically, this image of the lamp, this was because it was dark and there was little light, little to no natural light when it came to nighttime, right? So uh, you're thinking in terms of the people who are hearing this, okay? It's written to this group of Jews, right? But it's written for all of us, so we have to remember that the initial audience that's hearing it, they did not have, uh, you know, off-grid solar power. They had a little candle lamp, some sort of uh, way to create a small flame, and oftentimes it was shared within the context of their small home. They may not even have the resources to have a, a lamp in each room, and so this made sense to them. And I, listen, this is not some far stretch, right? You have been in a place when the power has gone out and it has been pitch black, and what do you do? You make your way to the flashlight. My, I, listen, when I was a kid, my grandmother made her way to those little oil lamps, right? She still kept those in her house, and she would go, and she would keep them ready. They were in every room of the house, and she would light them up. And when the power was out, we had a flame, right? So this isn't foreign. We understand this. Symbolically, uh, light often represents righteousness, truth, and God's presence. And so G Jesus is saying, like, like, like there's a physical flame, but you, are, you have a spiritual flame. Now look at Psalm 119, 105. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So the word of God in the darkest seasons of our lives brings direction and insight and structure and therefore light in the darkness. He goes on here in verse 36, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. And I was thinking in terms of being prepared, right? Uh, uh, there are different ways to be prepared for different things. When I'm preparing for vacation, I do it one way. When I'm preparing for a home invasion, I do it a different way, right? It'd be really odd if I knew that somebody was gonna break into my house and I pulled out my suitcase and started looking at my swimsuits, right? You would say, that's... That's craziness. And Jesus is making this analogy here that they're, you're preparing for something, right? And there are a couple of things that are happening. Uh, but the reason that you would prepare or the reason that you would take it seriously is because you have respect for the creator. You have respect for the father. And, I, and like this might sound really heavy handed and harsh, but if you're living your life in a way that you aren't actively engaged in the faith, there is a respect issue between you and the father. That's just the reality. You can go, yeah, I believe Jesus is the son of God. Yeah, I believe Jesus is returning. But if you're living like hell, you don't respect him. When you respect somebody, you interact with them differently. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw the first Fast and the Furious movie, but anytime I hear the word respect, I think of uh, the, uh, uh, the Brian racing uh, uh, and I, Dom's uh, character, or Dom, and, and, you know, they're racing for slips, but he's like, if I win, I want respect, right? And he's like, respect is earned. You don't just show up and go, like, can we make a trade for respect? Like, you act a certain way to gain respect. Your father has done that. He has carried his, his life, his legacy. It all points to the fact he deserves respect, right? He sent his son to die on the cross, for your transgressions, not for his enjoyment, for your transgressions. Why? So we 
could be redeemed, and therefore we should be able to respect him. And then he, he makes this reference to weddings. Like weddings during this time lasted for days, right? Uh, today, uh, somebody was telling me the other day that a friend of theirs was getting married, and they were talking about how it may or may not work out, but it's okay because it's only their first marriage, right? Like, like that's, that's shocking in this today, right? I think that might become more and more commonplace in the direction that culture's going. But I can tell you this, that in a Jewish household, when somebody got married, it was a beautiful time of celebration because it was seen as entering into a covenant before the Lord. It was something God had ordained. Now, I don't say that to demean anyone that has walked through a divorce. There are really solid biblical reasons for separating, okay? Uh, no one should live in an abusive household. Nobody has to be subject to that. Our goal in marriage, though, should never be, well, if this doesn't work out, I'll move on. Our goal should always be to find the person who will respect the Father the same way that I respect the Father, and therefore we will live a life that is filled with love and faithfulness. And so what is he saying right here at the beginning? He's saying, keep your faith alive and active. You got to do the work to keep it alive and active. You cannot simply show up at church one Sunday and go, man, that was a really great message that he brought. I believe in Jesus now. And then walk out the door and just live like hell all the time. He says, you've got to do the work to keep your faith alive and active. There are really just simple ways to, to engage in that. And as a church, we try, to, we try to create a way to offer that for you. We just came out of 21 days of prayer. Do you know that taking a couple of seasons a year where you just focus on praying every single day, that is a great way to help keep your faith alive and active. Uh, women's ministry, men's ministry, community groups are about to launch. Find people who will push you, who will challenge you, who will ask tough questions, who will teach you, be open to learning, be respectful of the word. Like you can live a life that is uh, where your faith is alive and active. And when you do that, right, you are actively carrying the lamp for when the dark seasons come. And, and this is what I can tell you. I'm, I, I would think I'm still young. I'm 44 for a few more days. And uh, and I would say this, like I have lived long enough to say that I can guarantee you, you will walk through some pretty dark seasons. There will be some things that will come that you will not enjoy. And if you have faith, you have light in the darkness. You have something to cling to. And I have watched enough people who have called themselves believers, who do not have an active faith, walk into dark seasons and spiral. And so I would say that keeping your faith active and alive is critical to the faith. Verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. Can I tell you something about the master? He understands how to serve. Like fundamentally, think about this for a moment. The father knows how to serve. Jesus knows how to serve. Think about that moment when they come in uh, from traveling and Jesus gets the towel and the wash bucket and begins to wash the feet of his disciples. That was somebody else's job, but he knew it needed to happen and so he was willing to do it. So what does it look like to serve? I mean, quite literally in the Greek, this means to attend to or to wait on. So it's not rocket science. There's no really deep hidden meaning behind this. It means, oh, I see something that needs to be done. I'm going to get it done. Now, here I will say that Christians tend to either lead or serve. But I want to tell you right now we're called to do both. And you might say to yourself, well, I'm not really much of a leader, but I don't mind serving. Praise God, we need you serving, but we need to push you to leading. And some of you might go, well, you know, I'm a... I'm a captain of everything I do, right? People follow me. I'm a great leader. Fantastic. We've got plenty of areas for you to lead. But can you also help wash dishes in the back? Jesus sets this not just as a standard, but as a way that he models his life. And so when you begin to separate the two, you are missing out on the fullness of what you could be walking in. And again, your faith then becomes more easily attacked. There is something critical 
about leading and serving, figuring out how to step into both areas, even when one of them is uncomfortable for you. Stepping into that area of leadership or that area of serving will, I promise you, it will do so, it will transform you and it will take, it will do something with your faith that anchors it deeper and deeper inside of you. I, I don't understand how people will say, like, like, like I, I want to know Jesus more, I want to hear from God, but they're not open to making changes in their lives. We have to be open to saying, look, the word says this, I'm, I'm willing to make a shift in the way that I'm thinking. Verse 38, if he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. Again, the, the weight of this is that you had no idea when the wedding was gonna end. And so he's been invited, the, the master's been invited to the wedding. It could last for days. And so the servant is back there waiting on them to return, and, and it says here, um, it says, blessed are those servants. That word in the Greek means to be happy, to be envied. I thought that was an interesting uh, uh, definition, right? Uh, a perspective, that when we are blessed, we have happiness and others want our happiness. So when I'm blessed, I have something that others are looking at going, I want what you have. And you know what the beautiful thing is, is it's not something that we have to hoard and hide. All we gotta do is point them to the cross. And then they can be blessed and they can have happiness and others can look at them and want what they have. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. And I think that fundamentally we get this. Like, if we knew that somebody was going to come and break into our home at a specific time, I would venture to say that most of the men in here would either be waiting on them or have the cops waiting on them. There's two different personality types out there. We know that's the case. But what we would all agree on is that though that thief would not have an easy time coming and robbing us. This word thief means to be a klepto. And if you look here in the Greek, it's kleptis, Right? And so that's where we actually get the word klepto. So a klepto or a stealer. So a thief is someone, they have an obsession. They, it, they feed on taking things that do not belong to them. And this is a, there's a violation that we experience when someone steals from us. When somebody comes and takes something from us, there is a psychological effect. And, and we know this. This is what baffles me, right? When we talk about uh, the way that we are going to handle thieves in our nation right now. You see, when someone else is being stolen from, there, we don't have that personal feeling. And so it's a lot easier to, to, to then look at the thief, right, as the, oh man, they're the, they're the real victim here. But the person who has been robbed from is walking through a psychological moment, a trauma. And when we go, oh, it's not a big deal, we're discounting the victim's emotions. And Jesus says here, he's talking to a group of people who do not think like us, right? Those, these people do not think like Americans or some of our Americans today. They do not think in terms of, oh, what's the big deal? They stole $1,000 worth of merchandise out of CVS, right? They would say, oh, well, if they're willing to steal $1,000 worth of makeup out of CVS, then they absolutely are willing to break into my home and steal from me. So they need to be dealt with by in, in, legal, in a legal, legal realm, right? So we get this. Like, this is innate. None of us think in terms of personally being stolen from as going, yeah, that feels great. I hope they do it again tomorrow. So as masters of our own homes, we take a thief robbing us very seriously, okay? Now, I'm not saying that if somebody comes in and they're stealing from you that you should go and beat them down, okay? I'm not making some, I'm not advocating for some form of violence, but when we know that somebody is a thief, do we just give them access to our homes? 
No, we wouldn't give them access to our homes. No more than we would give somebody who is a sexual predator access to our children, right? There are just boundaries that we create. And, and he's saying here that if you had known the thief was coming, you would have prepared for the thief. If you had known that someone was coming to hurt your family, you would have prepared for that. So imagine what your life would look like if you took the return of the king seriously. If you thought in terms of every day, he could show up at any moment. Jesus could come. What do I want to be doing when he gets here? What do I want to have accomplished when he shows up? So you also must be ready, verse 40, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So he says the thief comes and you don't know the thief is coming. We don't like that, right? Why? Because we weren't prepared. And if we had been prepared, the thief wouldn't have shown up. He says Jesus is going to show up. So if you'll be prepared when he shows up, you'll be ready. Now this is somebody you want to show up. But the problem is that when he shows up, you have to be prepared for it. This term ready means be prepared to be adjusted, regulated, not just like in panic mode. Oh my gosh, he's about to be here any minute. Ah! No, I am ready for his arrival. Now watch this. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? Let's talk about Peter for a second. Peter, right? Petra, the rock, right? Uh, this is a stubborn dude. This is a guy who thinks he's got it all figured out. And Jesus tells him, right, in Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. So Simon is Peter, and so he's telling him, he says, you know, hey, Satan has demanded you. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, Peter, living his life, following Christ, and what does Jesus say? Uh, when, when you have fallen and you come back, strengthen those around you. And Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Right, strong words. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Now, this is yet to happen. Like, this is the type of man that Peter is and he will continue to be, Peter sees himself as healthy and growing in the faith. And I just want to tell you, so if you're in here today and you're like thinking to yourself, like, yeah, I'm a, I love Jesus. This word's really good for somebody else. Peter was thinking the exact same thing, right? Is this for all of the uh, disciples over here or is it just for everybody, right? How much application does God, God's word have for you in your life? Not how much application does it, you know, they really needed to hear that. What do you need to hear? And he goes on, Jesus does, and the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? So <coughs> this picture of a manager, this is a steward or a guardian. So the, he says that the master is going to put somebody over his affairs while he is gone. And so what did the manager do? Sorry for the, the small uh, font here, but this is the, the manager would have overseen the servants, managed resources, land and agricultural management, uh, represented the master in, in, in legal duties, hospitality and event planning. Ultimately, he had the trust and authority of the master. So the manager wasn't just somebody who was like, you know, like in charge of a, you know, like, hey, you're just in charge of this little section. No, the master is gone and the manager, like, you have my authority in my place while I am gone. And he says, blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes, right? The one that is stewarding well. So. Blessed is the steward who is caring for the others that belong to the master. Jesus is giving this picture. Remember, we're walking right out of these resources, how you spend your money, what you give your money to. And he says, hey, why? Because there are a lot of people that need to be ministered to, a lot of people that need to be cared for. And you are my Ma manager, you are the person that I'm putting in charge. And so while I am gone, it is your responsibility to steward well and make sure that the needs of others are being met. And he says, truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. 
right? When will he do that? Upon his return. I just want to give you just a, a little bit of encouragement or hope today that like when we walk out that faith continuously and Jesus shows up and the new heaven and the new earth and we walk into eternity, there is a reward that is given to those who are faithful. And so when you are saved, you are given this position of trust. When you hear the gospel presentation and you acknowledge, I need to be saved, and you get saved, you're, you're put into a position of authority. This is why we talk about, as Christians, you have a spiritual authority in your life. He says, but if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. So who are these people? These are people who would say that they are Christians. They are followers, they are servants, but because he hasn't shown up, they live differently. And I got to tell you, stop misrepresenting the Father. I so much, I watch things in the news, I watch the way that people interact, and they, they do things that are completely in contradiction to the teachings of Christ, and they say, and I'm a follower of Christ. And I, I, just, I just long for, the, you know, some of them to just say, I'm not having anything to do with Jesus, and so that's why I make this stand. When people justify sinful behavior and call themselves Christians, it creates an issue for unbelievers because now there is a level of confusion because they have a group of people who look at the Word of God and say, God is capable of speaking thousands of years ago and speaking a truth that will be true for eternity. So his word is relevant to my life. I should study it and understand it, right? And then there is a group of people who would say, nah, I don't really buy into the whole Bible thing, but yeah, I believe in Jesus. And people on the outside are going, I, I, you know, this Christianity over here where I can do what I want to do and live how I want to live, this seems like the best Christianity to me. And that is... That, that, those people who are leading it are facing a consequence in their life. And the manager knows it's wrong, but it's easier. I, I get that. It is easier not to buck the system. It is easier to go with culture. It is easier to go with the mob. When they show up and they're screaming and they're yelling and making demands, it doesn't matter what percentage of the population they make up. It is easier in that influence to just... Give yourself over and agree with whatever they are saying. But it is not what we are called to do. We are called to stand on the word of God. We are called to be bold. We are called to be leaders. So all that you're doing in the end is hindering your own development. You might think to yourself like, okay, this will be easier. I'll get through the day. But I promise you this, when you're 10 years down the road, the fruit that you will be bearing, you will be looking and going, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to produce, right? Sometimes you have to, to walk through difficult seasons in order to get to the other side. Now, verse 46, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. So, like... You know, a lot of times scripture is like, yeah, it's a little pointed. It's a little, you know, you know, there are things we're a little uncomfortable. But like we could do a verse like this and, and Jesus says, you know, the master's going to show up and chop the person up, right? And we're reading that and we're like, is that what he meant, right? And I'm not going to lie, like I'm looking that up too. I'm like, what did that mean to a Jew, right? What did they think? Like they're sitting out here and he says the master's going to cut him up. And I want to let you know something today, that in the Greek, that meant that the master was going to show up and cut them up, right? <laughs> and you might think that's harsh, but for whatever reason, Jesus is trying to help you understand that there are consequences for your behavior. And one of them apparently that matters to him is that you are a reflection of him properly, so he seems to take it very seriously when people will call themselves Christians and live like hell. He's not that, he doesn't want anything to, to do with that individual. He wants you to stop. He wants you to be afraid of taking the mantle of Christ follower and abusing others and being a drunkard. 
And so there's a little bit of an intimidation factor going on here. I'm intimidated a little bit. But I will say this, the cutting in pieces is not to be understood literally, but as a metaphor for the severity of spiritual judgment on those who are unfaithful. And Jesus wants you to understand, right? He wants you to understand that there is a severe penalty, right, when you lead others astray. Now, having been given the knowledge of God's word, his expectations, and his trust, the unfaithful choose to live in a way that is contrary to his teachings. And uh, when we identify that somebody in our lives is taking the name of Christ and they're taking the authority that they've been entrusted with and they are abusing it, right? Like it is perfectly acceptable for you to call that person out and even more so to disassociate with them. You do not want to be caught up in a long-term relationship where you are partnering with people who are living like this. Now, sometimes you'll walk through seasons where you're having to be engaged in those relationships, but you do not want those people in the deep recesses of who you are. You want to minister to them, you want to challenge them, you want to call them out, but you want to make sure that you are stewarding well what you've been given responsibility over. And if you're caught up in the mess that's going on over there, we get this in our legal system, right? You're going to be, you're going to be seen as an accomplice. And so when somebody is doing a criminal behavior, we have to say, I can't be a part of this. I need to walk away from this. He goes on, and that servant who knew his master will, uh, master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. And so he kind of brings this in, and, and he says, like, like, as a servant, as somebody who says that I'm subjected to, to, to Christ's teaching, he says, when the master shows up, you will receive a severe beating. And this is sobering. This is not a fun conversation. I say this pretty regularly, like I try to, to, to do a lot of line-by-line -line teaching through the year because it, it ensures that you guys get the parts of Scripture that pastors don't want to teach, right? Because we don't want to talk about people being cut up and beaten. And Jesus says, you need to take this seriously. Your faith and the way you are walking it out matters. Do not be a hypocrite. Too many people are unbelievers right now because they look at the church and they see hypocrisy. Love people. Love them well. Serve them. Manage your resources. Be prepared as a believer. And somebody says, oh, well, you know, I won't serve an abusive God. And I'll tell you that this is not an abusive God. These are the consequences of behavior. And if you want to know abuse, serve the enemy. Because I promise you this, those that turn their back on God and subject themselves to the whims of the world, they are the ones that find themselves long-term in a place of genuine abuse. It's so difficult to, as a, as a pastor, to minister to people who are, um, you know, nearing end of life and they sit and talk to you about how all the mistakes they've made and that they have lived their entire life right to this point and there's no fruit. Like there's no, there's no benefit that they've added to society and they grieve that. Nobody sits there and says, man, I'm so glad I destroyed every relationship I touched. No, there's shame, there's guilt because they are aware that their choices time and time again led to destruction. Consequences help us understand how we should live our lives. And he goes on here in verse 48, but the one who did not know and did what deserved and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required, and from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. And so this helps to answer the question, what about those who did not have the direct word, the direct instruction? There are consequences because innately, you know, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says eternity is bound in the heart of man. Like, I, you know, we can say that, that we have a deep understanding hardwired inside of us for right and wrong. 
we know when we're abusing somebody, right? This is why the atheist can make the statement and say, well, you know, morality isn't necessarily a Christian thing. No, it's a humanity thing because the God of Christianity made sure that whether you are a believer or not a believer, that deep inside of you, you know what's right and what's wrong. And in order to become the type of narcissist or obsessive person that can just tune that out, that takes you spending a lot of time, energy, and effort suppressing who God made you to be. So I want to end by just bringing a little bit of levity and hope to the story. What are the rewards of faithful living? Now, I don't have time to go through all of this scripture. Uh, we have a, all of this is available online. You can go to Facebook, YouTube, and go back through this. Um, in, the, uh, the, in the descriptions for our sermons, I always put all of our uh, scriptures for the day. So, like, if we've covered a bunch of scripture and you're like, what were all those? You can go right over to either of those places, go to the description, and you will see a summary that has all of these. So, one of the rewards is a eternal life, John 3, 16. We see that there are crowns for different achievements, okay? We have the crown of life given to those who persevere under trials, James 1, 12, Revelation 2, 10. The crown of righteousness for those who long for Christ's appearing, 2 Timothy 4, 8. The crown of glory for faithful pastors and elders, 1 Peter 5, 4. An incorruptible crown for those who exhibit self-control and mastery. That's 1 Corinthians 9.25. Reigning with Christ. 2 Timothy 2.12. There are treasures in heaven. Matthew 6, 19 through 20. Uh, recognition and praise from God. That the God of the universe that made all things is going to pause what he is doing and recognize you. Because you have lived a life that reflects his instruction. Matthew 25, 21, Revelation 2, 17, 22, 14, and uh, 21, 3 through 4. And those were just a few that I pulled together real quick, but the scripture is filled with promises for the saints, for those that are believers. And my hope in this, uh, in this message today is that you will have the type of discipline that you will be disciplined in your faith and that you will be prepared, living your life as if Jesus is returning tomorrow. Now, don't let that be confused with living your life because you think civil war is coming tomorrow, okay? A lot of people go, oh, Jesus could be here tomorrow. That means we're going to be at war, right? When Jesus shows up, Jesus will handle it all, okay? Okay, you might have some fears about what's happening in the world around you, and, and those are, that's a conversation over coffee, okay, not from the platform. The conversation from the platform is this. If Jesus is showing up tomorrow... How can you have an impact on humanity? Our women's event that, that my wife put together with the lead ladies of our church uh, that they did last week, can I tell you, we had a, a, a lady from the Savannah Mission Bible Training Center come and give her heart to the Lord on that first night, right? She got saved because of, and let me tell you, so we charged $15 a head, okay, which brought in like, I think they said $450, and we spent almost $2,000, but we can't do stuff like that if the church doesn't make and if you don't give of your resources. We can't, we can't make those types of investments into our community. When we do red on uh, the third Saturday of the month and we give out food, I'm not sure if you know this, but we go and pay for that food that we give out, right? That happens because people manage their resources, give to the church, and then we turn around and we go and we make the investment forward. Right? And let me tell you, I would argue that there isn't a price tag we could put on an individual coming to know Jesus. But there is a price tag on what we can put on the things we do because we have a bank account. And when it hits zero, the bank doesn't go, oh, man, that person could get saved. That would be great. Not interested. Right? And so the reality is, is it takes the resources of people like you. And I don't like talking about it, but it's the truth. And then your time. Community groups are about to kick off. We're just weeks away from uh, kicking off the spring session of community groups. Guys, showing up in a community group doesn't just benefit you. It benefits everyone in the room, right? 
Because when you show up and you begin to develop those relationships, you might be growing individually in that space. A lot of times that's what we think. We think, oh, man, this would be good for me or it wouldn't be good for me. But where can I add value, right? Where can I show up that when somebody else might be in need, the, the, the life that I'm living can impact them? And so community groups are launching. Like all of the things that we are attempting as a church to do to disciple, mentor, and lead our people and impact our community, they all come because of the faithful who will one day receive the rewards for the way that they have lived their lives. Let's stand. I want to pray this blessing over you, and then we're going to dismiss, and we're going to celebrate Peter and Enid. I saw them walk in. They're in the back back there, and they are a, a beautiful married couple. Uh, we have invested. Can I, can I tell you, we're going to, you're going to celebrate Peter and Enid in a moment. We have been making an investment in the ministry of Pita's dad in Kenya now for almost a decade, the ministry that he's over. And uh, Pita was trying to get to the United States to get his master's degree, and he was, not, he was struggling getting the uh, visa. Uh, and so we, our church, we stepped in, we helped back that, we helped support him, and then he got here, and we, listen, you're giving, we helped support him through his uh, two years for his master's degree. And you might think, well, you know, why would we do that? Can I tell you, this is what our elders, and, and my, this is what we genuinely believe, and we talked about this when we made the decision to do this. We believe that we're making an investment in an individual who will take the resources that God will bless him with and pay it forward. And, and this man, Bishop Achunga in Kenya, who is planting churches and running himself ragged. Uh, there are over a hundred churches planted in the area that he helps to oversee. The man never gets a break hardly. We are investing in, in good, fertile kingdom soil by making an investment in that man of God's family. And that only happens, again, because of the way that you decide to manage your resources. And so today we're going to celebrate uh, Peter and Enid. And Enid's uh, dad, mom and dad are ministers. Her dad passed away preaching the gospel years ago. And, uh, and so this, we're going to celebrate with them because we are a family that goes far beyond this city, this little community. So I hope you'll stick around uh, for a little bit and love on them and celebrate with them. Let me, let me get, pray this blessing over you and then we'll, we'll dismiss. Lord, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance and upon you and give you peace. Lord, help us, help us to be active in our faith. Help us to be bold in our faith. Lord, let us not sit here consumed by the warnings for unfaithful living. Let us be encouraged to just pursue faithful living so that the lives of those around us will be transformed and changed. Lord, thank you for all that you're doing in our midst. We love you and praise you. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. We love you guys. If you want to be here, it is a potluck. You can run and go grab food if you didn't bring anything and come right back. Uh, and be sure to love on Peter and Enid. Sins are